I've heard mm -hmm. you use some analogies previously to describe roles of different parts of the brain in our experience mm -hmm. in particular. <laughs> I don't know if you got this from Steve Peets initially, but referring mm -hmm. to different parts of the brain as different animals, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that might make some sense in the light of evolutionary biology and comparative biology, mm -hmm. but can you just expand on that and maybe just yeah. talk, talk about your chimp a bit, Simon? Yeah, that's right. So the, the idea of thinking about our thinking, right, metacognition, uh, is has a long and storied history in psychology and philosophy and the rest of it. And it's not contentious to say that we think when we're thinking, uh, just as we've had this discussion about, you know, the time in between thoughts, so who's the who's the observing self and who's the one, that, that we have, we talk to ourselves, right? That's not a contentious thought. We all talk to ourselves. We're having a conversation. But who are we having a conversation with? We're having a conversation with ourselves. Okay, but that that doesn't make sense in the in the in a in a rational sense. You you you're not you're you're assuming in your head you've got personas. You're not just like talking out loud. You're having almost like a, a discussion or an argument, a pros and cons or whatever. There's a debate happening in our heads. And that notion that there are multiple selves or there's multiple ways of processing from whether it's through we talked about default mode network or time in between thoughts to you know uh having you know chimps or professors or giving a metaphors is really at the essence saying that uh, if you add a metaphor to that notion that they are we are having an internal conversation what metaphor makes most sense from now what we understand about the brain and essentially Moving from the, the small print here, before I start talking about this, there's the little caveat, the scientific caveat is we know that the brain is no longer that kind of that old functional model of, you know, you've got your thinking brain and your lizard, brain, whatever, you know, there's two because it's networks and algorithms. But I'll stick to this sort of metaphor because it helps us action that doesn't contradict the biology, even the network and algorithm approach, because it helps us come up with actionable things that we can do to either resolve some of the fights in our head to make us feel calmer and more peaceful or to know which voice we should be listening to right um in certain situations and so uh this notion that we have a sort of prehistoric primordial part of our brain the oldest that's been with us since we were you know flip flapping in onto the shores of uh, before we were upright homo sapiens uh it's a reactive machine the limbic system in in sort of brain anatomical terms is where most of this seems to happen even though there's notion that's networks now rooms but we know that these like the the fight or flight response we know where our emotional processing happens these urges and cravings things that are so evolutionary deep wired hardwired for survival and procreation the human brain has, as and mind is has is a remarkable, simple, and grossly under uh, um, um, under what's the what's the phrase I'm looking for? It, it, it can't match the complexity of our modern environments, right? The thinking in terms of these just basic drives of human life, because our environment has outpaced our brain's ability to adapt and change along those lines. So the limbic system, which we say acts a bit like a chimp. So your limbic system giving you these cravings, these drives that come from that feeling in your gut that might even defy rational thought. What I really want to do versus what I should do, I ought to do. What I really want to do or what I would do if no one was looking is often at the heart of what your chimp is thinking, right? Because your chimp has fairly simple things. It wants to keep you alive. It wants you to shag. It wants you to be, you know, worshipped. It wants you to be, you know, the top of the social hierarchy, all the things that, you know, have some evolutionary function. And if you only listen to those things, your brain, you would become, where well, you'd be in jail, essentially, right? Because you'd steal, you'd rape and pillage. You'd just act on those instincts without any moral or responsible oversight. And so um, the way that that brain, that part of our, that, that network in our brain, the chip brain works, is also stacked in favor of it winning. Evolution has given it properties so that it wins the fight when we try and out-rationalize an angry, emotional part of ourselves. 
And the reason for that is because the limbic system, the chimp brain is survival oriented and procreation oriented, no amount of logic, it needs to win the fight against logic when logic could be wrong, right? So the analogy I often give is if I'm seeing someone who may be threatening and they have something in their hand and I can't tell whether it's a knife or a pen or what have you, logic would say, well, we'll go closer and try and figure out what it is. That's not a very good survival mechanism, right? It's like, I need to get out of there. I don't know, it, probably the likelihood that it could be dangerous is too, blah, blah, blah. So we need, the brain needs the ability to get you out of situations or do things that are against, might be against your, like shagging, procreation, uh, and libido is another good example. We often follow our libido despite every like rational thought of what you're fucking up in your life by doing that, whether it's infidelity or all those other things that get us in trouble by this listening to this simple craving. And so at the heart of human, the internal struggle is managing my little chimp, my tantruming toddler in a supermarket. I can't like it's, I want that. I must have that. And you're like, listen, you're using facts and logic with a two-year-old or a, a young underdeveloped prim is not going to win you have to use distraction right you have to use bribery you have to use all the the tools for primitive underdeveloped sort of ways of thinking but humans have also got a very sophisticated frontal cortex planning organizing executive functions so we call those your professor brain because they are very facts and logic empirical driven and so if you think about even though gross oversimplification that the battle in our heads is between these two competing forces, whether you want to think about it as chimp versus professor or wants versus shoulds or ought tos, uh, intentions versus actions, right? What, uh, that It still comes back to that same battle. But because biology has given your chimp brain the upper hand to stop your rational brain always winning the day, it becomes a fight, a David and Goliath fight, right? So your chimp, so for example, one of the things that when you have this uh, a stimulus, something in your environment th that you perceive as threatening, a, a cascade of neural hormonal responses to that prime your body to fight, to run, is happening with such lightning speed before your professor brain is even aware of, oh my God, I'm under threat. And okay, now let's logically think through it. And we've all experienced this. If you've swam in open water or in the sea and something brushes up against your leg, the startle reflex, oh, what the fuck, uh, you know, and you're already, your heart's running. You haven't thought, well, hang on a minute. It's probably just that. It's lightning speed. So this notion that your limbic system can instigate a hormonal neurochemical response, the train has left the station by the time your little puny, you know, fat, I can dissect you with words and logic is it's too overpowering and not only does my brain my chimp brain get a head start on it but it actively sabotages my professor's brain ability to do anything about it part of those neurochemical hormonal neuromodulator responses are almost paralyzing or slowing down an already slow analytical part of our brain right we don't we can't think clearly we don't we don't we're not we don't have all of our faculties to make those decisions anyone who's given a presentation and suddenly forgets everything they were supposed to be saying i'm no dumber than i were 10 minutes ago but there's something about the agitation and this neural nervous system response to so suddenly making my memory really questionable or what my what I know already if I practice there's not suddenly that's what choking is essentially right we suddenly get into this like making these most basic errors and so at the heart of this battle is is not so much winning that fight but letting them live the chimp and the professor in harmony right and the analogy might be that if we can get the discussion to be or the intern experience to be uh, I know I've, 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 I'm now a little acutely aware that I'm on this train leaving the station mode and I can say, hang on a minute, uh, I've got this. I know that you're concerned and worried about them being humiliated, embarrassed and rejected, but, you know, the world will still turn uh, in the morning uh, and it, this isn't life and death. I know you think it is, Chip Brain, because you'll still have primordial, you know, 
you know that all I'm trying to do is either not being punched by that ape or killed by that ape, or I'm trying to shag the ape's sister or whatever the, the instinctive drive is, uh, or brother, uh, then um, uh, I need to somehow wrestle back to say, you know what, it's going to be okay. If all I try and do is punch my chimp in the face or put, say, to my toddler, screaming toddler in the supermarket, the proxy for the chimp, just be quiet. God damn, there's people around. Be quiet. Can't you see you're acting out? It doesn't matter. It doesn't work. So I have to be a little bit cleverer in how I navigate that relationship. And so this chimp professor brain analogy that Steve Peters came up with, but the notion of, you know, having metaphor, lizard brain, elephant and rider, whatever you, there, there's lots of people have come up with the same thing. The, the voices in my head represent an argument between competing factions, you know, on the one hand, fairly simple, instinctive, emotional, fight or flight, survive, eat, shag, be, be powerful and important versus, you know, execution and contemplative thought and meaning and purpose and all the other rich things of life, psychological life, they fight. And that fight is responsible for most of our mental anguish. So strategies to quieten the chimp, make your professor brain more powerful, learning how to talk a screaming toddler out of a supermarket tantrum with all the handing them a, you know, a treat or bribery or distraction, that is at the heart of what these techniques are aimed to do. So tell me about your chimp purge. And also, is the chimp purge something that was born of your coaching or does that have experimental evidence behind it? Yeah, there is some evidence behind it. So the chimp purge is, uh, is on going back to this sort of analogy between this instinctive, uh, reactive, uncaring of social and moral worlds, just like what I want when I want it, um, is that if you try and stifle it, right, if you try and say, no, not now, not, you know, it will, it's like a pressure cooker. It will eventually, just like self-determination, these core needs that we have, if you thwart them and try and restrict them, it eventually they'll, because they're innate and they need to grow, they'll, you know, it's like bamboo. The, the roots will come up through the sidewalk, they'll uproot houses, they, you'll have, it's a price you have to pay. So the way to, is to not stifle it by the, a self-help meme of looking in the mirror and saying, I'm strong, I'm powerful, I know I can, I'm important. And, you know, five seconds later, you, you're at the victim of all the other reasons your chimp brain is way, can overpower those thoughts is to say, what if I just let my chimp rant? What if I let it say all the things that it's worried about or nervous about or secretly wants? And I don't get in its way. I don't use my professor brain, my analytical brain, to ridicule it or to say, I know this is silly to think this, but if I'm honest, this is why I'm thinking. Don't let that judgment get in the way. Just let it come out. And so this notion of purging of so not restricting unwanted thoughts or desires i don't mean you act on them but you just let you listen to that part that voice seems to quieten down the a activation in the limbic system that we've measured through blood flow and blood flow in the brain is a proxy for where oxygen goes is a proxy for activation of brain structures and so on so we know that if you can you can quieten down something by letting it be heard right so a chimp purge is a, is a strategy simply to say, when I'm having feelings that I, or thoughts or things I don't want, and that's the question that you know whether you need to even do this, right now, am I, do I want to think or feel like this? If the answer is no, or I'd rather think something differently, I'm staying on the start line, I want to feel excited, but I'm just shitting my pants, I'm terrified, or I want to, this to be like, I want to, you know, I want to be excited about my this first date, or I want to really be invested in this intimate physical connection I've got with a new partner, but I don't want to get hung up on performance anxiety or all the other like little things that might, might be going on in your brain, is that you're trying to let all those things out. Your chimp almost like, okay, I've had my say, crawls back in his little cage or the kid stops crying in the supermarket. And then you can get on with the routine, mundane business, boring life of, you know, life in the suburbs of just, 
you know, having sex and enjoying it or having an experience and not overthinking it or, or getting too caught up. It's not the be all and end all, you know, the last, those last five minutes that you relive of your middle school, high school basketball game that you missed a shot and you've been forever tarnished with, you know, that shape our narrative, whatever they happen to be. That how do we get free of those things? Uh, and one of the healthy you know, mental flossing strategies, pinch to the pain. So it's simply for two minutes and it typically takes two min- two to 15 minutes to truly exhaust all of the worries that your chimp brain has. You're saying them out loud. So if mine was in uh, in sport and I was a cyclist, I married a professional triathlete, which meant that I had to do a triathlon and I'm a sports psychologist. So oh my God, I've got to do a sport that I'm two of which I'm you know, not very good at, and I'm supposed to be the mind fixer of this stuff. And oh my God, I'm going to come out the water last in my wave. And people are going to be thinking, oh my God, him, I thought he was supposed to be good. And he's a sports psychologist. Look how rubbish, all the thinking that goes through that. So if I have my chimp purge where I'm saying in the car before I get out to do my race the night before, you know, you're saying, you know, you're do something what do something you're good at you're shit you're not you're not you can't swim you're terrible people will be laughing at. again this is not rational this is just where the chimp is wants you to go you know and it's usually the worst self talk in the world you know you're on the right lines if you're giving yourself a negative self talk because at the heart of feelings that i want is usually aspects of negativity so you're just letting all that out without interrupting it and if you say it out loud and someone hears they're like oh my god you're so hard on you're so cruel to yourself but you don't. So you do it in private. You do it. You can write it down. You can say it out loud. But a curious thing happens when you've done that and, it, and you've exhausted all of the stuff, your mud that your chimp is slinging at you. And you know you've exhausted it when it starts repeating itself. There's no more new ammuni- ammunition. So I'm like my swimming example. It might be, OK, yeah, you are slow and you, you're not quick and your body isn't great when it's not in, you know, Spanx like her and all the things that I might be worried about. And I start to like think of those things in sort of a uh, in, in a sort of a they OK, what else? OK, you you could drown. You're going to be last. You're going to look ridiculous. And you kind of got a dad bod. OK, that's four. Anything else? Come on, there must be something else. That you, uh, what about you look sort of, you know, as though you've had a stroke when you come out. You can't find your bike uh, because you're so disoriented and people are laughing. OK, that's another thing. Anything else? Come on, there must be more things that you hate. And when you can't think of your chimp that purge, you know that you're kind of done with it and then you stop. And for most people, that takes between two to 15 minutes, depending on how active you are. And after that period, you feel lighter. You're mentally, psychically, you feel as though unburdened. Listening to my problems, don't solve them. Don't always try and fix them. Just listen to them. How many times have, is that a source of relationship you know, is at that essence, that's telling us that the act of purging, of just getting stuff out that I'm worried about, even if it's not going to happen, even if it's ridiculous to think that, even if it's irrational, it doesn't matter. There's, there's, there's utility from a neurological and psychological perspective on getting that stuff out. And so that's what the chimp purge is designed to do. And what about breathing to chill the chimp? Yeah, chill, chill, chill the gym. Yeah, breathing also now is having a bit of a moment, isn't it, in uh, in health terms. And of course, which is ironic because we've been doing it <laughs> uh, for uh, millennia. Um, but breathing can also help because if we think of some of these reactions that our chimp brain is 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 really instigating, the fight or flight response or the stress response, that parasympathetic strand of our nervous system taking over cortisol, testosterone, all the things that we know are happening, adrenals are working hard, then autonomic function, natural and fairly self-governed autonomous processes in in our body are happening all the time. And we don't have much control over those. But now some of the science say, well, we can sort of, we do, we can influence some of those things. You can't influence your heart rate. Well, now we know that you can by by a feedback and thinking certain thoughts. You can lower your heart rate. This is an automatic function. I might not be able to do it with my spleen or other aspects of you know what's happening in my body, but I can do it with some things. My heart rate is one, and another automatic or autonomic function, respiration. I can also intervene on. I can't 
I can hold my breath, but I can never suffocate myself by holding my breath so I die because the breath reflex will kick me out of that. But I can change the cadence of my breath. I can change the frequency, how quickly I breathe, whether I breathe, you know, how long I take to breathe in versus I breathe out. And that has an impact on some of these autonomic functions that govern the stress response. So some of the newer science of understanding how patterns of respiration and patterns of breathing impact different aspects of our, of our, of our nervous system, our parasympathetic and sympathetic, are really important. So for example, breaths that focus on, when I say focus on, spend more time doing, like there's a longer phase, uh, on inhalation, right? So this might be Lamar's breath or Wim Hof breathing. Or, so it's a very inhale, in. In uh, inspira inspiration focused activity versus focusing on the out breath seems to elevate sympathetic response, gets us energized and activated adrenaline response. And so there are some parts in life where we want to have that. If, if you're one of these people that struggles to get out of bed in the morning or is always hitting the snooze button and oh, I find some struggle, you need a strong adrenaline response. So doing a pattern of breathing that's inhalation focused, short, sharp inhalation is going to elevate neurologically and chemically so that you feel able to get out of bed rather than just willing yourself. And the converse is also true. Breaths that focus on the on expiration or the time that you spend breathing out in comparison to breathing in is the opposite. It's, it activates the parasympathetic response, which is the rest and digest. So this would be, I might be focusing on my in-breath, like I might go... So my out breath might be twice as long as my in breath. It's going to have a parasympathetic effect. So the, then we can start to think of the pattern of breathing having different functions. If I want to feel up and energized, I can do inhale for inhalation focused. If I want to feel calmer and less anxious or I want to be uh, uh, exhalation. And what if I just want a, a general mental flossing teeth cleaning breath as good pattern of breathing? It's the box breath, right? So it might be just the, the inhalation focus that I breathe in for the same amount of time I breathe out. And you might think that even that is, well, of course, isn't that what we do naturally? Well, it isn't because we have one of the aspects, one of the parts of our brain that controls respiration and breath is also has to function that we have to talk and still breathe. So you can't rhythmically breathe and talk at the same time. You can't sing at the same time. So the human brain has to cope with breathing in an irregular pattern because we sing and we talk. And so we don't just default to this kind of nice, you know, square breath pattern. But focusing on doing that and taking time out to stop talking or to stop chewing or to stop eating so quickly or whatever enables us to recalibrate the direct portal to our, how our nervous system reacts. So breath is really important. One of the most critical and seems and gathering more and more evidence of this led the champion of whom is, is Andrew Huberman, the visual neuroscientist at Stanford. He didn't coin this, but he's one of the, you know, the, sort of the person who's spoken about this the most is the physiologic sigh breath. The breath, the breathing pattern that seems to be the quickest and most effective way to reduce sympathetic nervous activation, uh, fight or flight response as quickly as possible uh, is a very so sort of uh, 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 an unusual, a bit powerful, potent form of uh, like, like strategy of, uh, of a breath pattern. And that physiologic sigh, S-I-G-H breath or physiologic cyclic breathing is often known is you breathe in through your nose twice, one on top of the other. So it's a stacked nasal inhale, right? Followed by a hold about the same amount of time as the two nasal inhales. And then an out breath through the mouth, an expiration that's double the length of the in breath. So it's a, it's a stacked nasal inhale and there are physiologic and respiratory reasons why two breaths, in breaths, one off the other is more effective at you know, shunting and uh, and and uh, carbon dioxide and a whole set of pressure on the heart, a whole host of alveoli inflation or a whole host of other physiological factors seems to be helpful. So this breath, which looks like one rotation of this, which looks like this,
One physiologic side breath, it seems to be the quickest way to activate that parasympathetic rest and digest system. And if you do that two or three times, you get an even stronger benefit. After two or three times, it's diminishing retention, you get no more benefit. So it's something I can do even three times in 30 seconds to quickly put my nervous system in a position to be able to have access to my memories, to what I've studied, to how I'm about to, what I remembered I need to do in the moment. And it's something that we can, we should be teaching kindergarten kids, not just use your words, Johnny, use your breath, Johnny, so that my nervous system, the soil in which I'm hoping to grow deliberate thought that's, that has all of your faculties, your memories available, conscious action, moral decision, seems to happen. And so it's a really good way of controlling that in situ quickly. I might play devil's advocate just for a second. Yeah, yeah. And just add that, to my knowledge, there's only been one study of the physiological sign in humans that was published very recently yep. from Huberman's yep. lab. And he compared yep. five minutes a day of either physiological yep. size, box breathing, mm -hmm. or inhale emphasized mm -hmm. breathing, yep. Yep. or meditation, which was a slightly strange meditation intervention, and yep. found that yep. at the end of the intervention, positive affect increased most in the physiological mm -hmm. side group numerically mm -hmm. negative affect actually probably decreased most mm -hmm. in meditation group but the studies probably mm -hmm. underpowered to mm -hmm. detect differences but i just add that these different types of breathing haven't mm -hmm. otherwise really been compared head to head and in terms of mm -hmm. the literature at large i would just say mm -hmm. what you said about the importance of emphasizing exhalation and a longer exhalation mm -hmm. relative to inspiration mm -hmm. Seems mm -hmm, to be particularly mm -hmm. important to calming, and a simple mm -hmm. way that you can do that is just to exhale through pursed lips. And then finally, mm -hmm. in terms of breathing in general, lots of people speak about nasal breathing nowadays, and I think that that does make sense for many different reasons that that we don't need to get into. But I don't want to get too caught up on breathing, and I, I think you no, no, and I, but just to just to just as a quick little interject there, mm. you're right. In fact, um, I think that the general sense of ha focusing on inhalation, of, of thinking of inhalation and exhalation as having physiologic different effects, uh, and and not just physiologic in terms of neurochemical, but also mechanical effects like the thoracic cavity, the pressure on your heart, the how your heart changes in volume in response to how open your thoracic cavity is or mechanical or otherwise seems to have impact on on our feeling states and so um i my perspective on this as with most things in apply at the really applied end of psychology is that if there's an insufficient biological evidence to support meaning how we think about you know categories of evidence randomized control trials even the absence of that evidence isn't necessarily an obstacle to doing something anyway if under and here's the big if the side effects of doing that are not harmful or catastrophic uh there's some belief in or expectancy we can get into expectancy in placebo and the potency of expectancy in the human mind that it works is important and subjectively subject that's the important part you feel differently than i you know this is the 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 physical is like compression normatec boots right for recovery it's like well hardly any evidence to show that they work but people athletes say i feel better i love using them i'm going to keep you then keep doing them right there's no other than that you can't walk in there's no side effects doing that so the same goes for breathing and i think that because there are biological pathways if you look at sort of hills criteria for causation or whatever you want to do to say in the absence of all the studies that we need to show that this is an evidence-based statement what do we do in the meantime do we just not do anything well no you can say okay there are some scientific methods for for sort of swimming through that quagmire one of which is they call them hills criteria right what are the criteria for that to establish a causative path meaning we know that this works there's evidence for it works you don't necessarily have to have all criteria necessarily fulfilled you say well there's enough for example if we have a biological mechanism if we if we know that there's a pathway well, through which this could work we have evidence for it yet for example autonomic uh, sorry parasympathetic versus sympathetic activation all the 
all the soup and the and the you know the the the, the mechanics and the chemistry of why that works and how that's tied to breathing. There's a pathway how this might that tells us that we might be onto something we might eventually have the evidence for versus if it completely counters what we know from biology, then that would be a reason to say, hang on a minute, I'm not sure that, you know, singing the national anthem backwards is going to help me give a better presentation, right, or whatever. Yeah, and you mentioned biofeedback earlier too. I'll just add that obviously you can use proxies of parasympathetic nervous system activities such Mm -hmm. as HRV and then use biofeedback interventions based on that. And so breathing Mm -hmm. in conjunction with biofeedback, if anything, seems to be better at shifting the nervous system in the direction in which you want to shift it than just canned breathing protocols. But Mm -hmm. on the subject of breathing, that's obviously an example of an emotion focused coping Mm -hmm. strategy, an idea that Mm -hmm. that you Mm -hmm. introduced me to Simon, Mm -hmm. just wondering if you Mm -hmm. could explain the difference between those and then problem focused ones, maybe give an example of a problem focused one. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so uh, in essence, uh, when the way that we think that humans cope with stress, um, and again, I'm not using that in a scientific sense, I'm just using it in a lay sense, because we all kind of know what we mean by that. I'm feeling uh, as though what's being asked of me is more than my internal ability to, to meet those demands. Let's use that as a really, you know, crude stress threshold at the moment. Um, then our, how we go about fixing that dilemma uh, as humans uh, in ourselves, how do I get out of this? We tend to gravitate to one of two types of strategies. So think of these not as strategies per se, but as buckets of strategies. So one is what we call task focused or problem focused, which is essentially what it means is that if I'm going, if I'm feeling overwhelmed at work, I've identified the source of that stress, the external source, which is lots of work being asked of me. My intray is is high, my metaphorical intray. So I'm just going to work harder, longer, quicker. I'm going to do something that actively targets reducing the source of the stress at its source, right? So problem focused, I'm trying to reduce the source of the problem or task focused, I'm doing an activity to directly reduce potency of the input that's driving that discrepancy what's being asked of me is one category and so a a simple example of this is uh if you have to take a test or if you have to take a challenge a physical challenge i'm going to give a ted i'm not i'm just making this up i'm going to give a ted talk in two months time i've never given a ted talk shit next year next year next year okay a a task focused approach to feeling stressed about a TED talk is to, okay, I'm going to learn about what TED talks are, how do people do them, how long they last. I'm going to learn about what uh, in a TED talk, uh, how, you know, the audio visual aids I'm going to get, who my audience is. I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at the skills to give a better TED talk. Right. That's a task focus problem. It just is in the way as, oh, my God, I'm so nervous about my first triathlon. I've never swum in open water before and the waves and, oh, my God, and what am I going to do? And well, why don't you get better at ocean swimming? Why don't you take a class in surf lifesaving? Why, why don't you become a stronger swimmer? How about that? Let's start with that rather than, oh, my God, I'm confident. I'm beautiful. I know I can. No, just be better. Right. Do better. Train more. Learn more. Right. So task focus. The other type of bucket of strategies is emotion focused coping. And this is now another innately human approach. It's not wrong or right. It just is the one of the ways we do it is instead of targeting the sort at its source, the, 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 the pain point at source, you're changing the filter of what it means to you or how much you you act on it or listen to it. Right. So you're doing nothing to change the stress, the source of the stress, you're just doing something to change how that feels. And on one extreme, that just might be avoidance, right? Uh, I'm going to, oh my God, I've got all that at work. Or the kid who has a stomach, a mysterious stomach ache on the day of a test, right? Uh, is an is it, is an emotion focused coping. I reduce anxiety by making the problem go away or not having to deal with it. I'm in denial. That's an emotion focused coping. Meditation is an emotion focused coping, right? I can see thoughts or I cannot, my passive attention training, I don't get latched on my default. No, I don't go down that rabbit hole. I can just see it and I'm not, I'm going to see it, but I notice it, but not focus on it and so on. 
So drinking heavily, numbing yourself, excessive exercise, right? Anything that these experiential avoidance strategies, uh, consuming massive amounts of simple carbohydrates, right? Uh, within a short period of time, getting through a half pound box of licorice or or Skittles or whatever you, because my spike my cortisol, uh, um, or sorry, uh, uh, reduce my cortisol within 30 seconds, I'll instantly feel better. Now there's a price we pay for that in the long run, but it's an emotion focused coping strategy. And we tend to use one or more of a strategy that fits in those buckets. And what the, the Jedi stress managers do, the people who operate in unbelievable high stress environments with, you know, we're talking about not just uh, uh, in sort of people who are in life and death situations like special forces or military or people in the military, but also, you know, like high performance, like surgeons. If I just one, you know, if I'm two millimeters cu uh, uh, cutting away, what uh, this person's life is very different. It matters. Athletes, you know, if you're a Formula One driver, it matters what I'm actually trying to how I'm coping with my stress at 200 miles an hour when I have 100 milliseconds to figure out in my mirror where that person is. So it matters. So these Jedi stress manage, uh, 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 copers use both. And that's the big take home lesson. If you want to be very good at management, you have to have a list of emotion focused coping strategies and a list of task focus and you do them together in combination you don't only rely on one or the other and the easiest way to know this is think about stress in your own life and then make a list of all the ways that i find and some of which are horrendously embarrassing some of which are sort of almost uh you know you're proud of but you make a list of all the different weird and wonderful ways that you manage stress in your life and some of which you may not even connect to stress right you might even just say you know, boredom and you end up doing X, Y, Z. Boredom is also a form of stress on the body, right? So you find yourself daydreaming or, you know, going down TikTok rabbit holes or whatever it happens to be. And so recognizing what you do and seeing which list or which of the categories you tend to rely on to shore up and give yourself and teach yourself with habits, other strategies to give you a more well-rounded approach to coping seems to be the most effective. And I will say, it's also, you know, we talked about that little joke about, you know, don't listen to my problem. You don't solve my problems, just listen to them. That argument at its essence, at its core, is a discrepancy between a task-focused coper and an emotion-focused coper. Someone who prefers or gravitates towards emotion over, and someone gravitates over task focus. If someone tells me all the shit that they're dealing with and how they're stressed, my, as a task-focused coper, my default is going to be trying instantly solve problem. Okay, so you said that. So what if you did this? You're trying to get them, whereas someone is saying, I, don't, don't, I just want you to listen to my problems. My emotion-focused coping is just is purging, right? It's getting it out, just talking it through. Even if there's no solutions, I feel better after that. And you're just trying to solve everything. Just talking about it is the solving part of it. Task versus emotion-focused coping. So that is at the heart of many arguments as well about how we encounter and deal with stress so recognizing that is is helpful and that also brings up the subject of acceptance which mm -hmm. to me in some ways differentiates something like acceptance and commitment therapy from cbt mm -hmm. i was just mm -hmm. wondering if you could maybe touch on the importance of that i know that you sometimes use an analogy of watching two sides of a war take place yeah yeah and how that yes. represents the human mind I know I'm a huge fan of metaphor and uh, in science teaching, even though many scientists hate metaphor because it's an oversimplification and all the other reasons we know. But listen, if you're in the, the world, if you've been in science communication, which is what most teaching is, plenty of undergraduate teaching, right? Metaphor, as long as you understand the limits to it, can really be helpful grapple with with concepts. And so it's, it's a fairly um, sort of interesting or, or or helpful way of thinking about is there is there something in particular an example in particular you'd like me to like talk about or mention is it like an angle of it that is re more more relevant no, for your listeners versus going down a no not at all i just think that it's important for people to realize that you're always going to have these internal battles going on in your head yeah. And you can yeah, yeah. do things to help cope okay. with them. You can try and solve problems, 
but there's also yep. a time at which you just have to accept that they will always be there. And there are yep. things that you yep. can do yep. to help you with that process. Meditation yep. being one of yep. them, but sure. ACT obviously introduces many different types okay. of exercises. Yeah. Sure. sure. So maybe, okay, so keeping this at a general level, coming back to that underlying, you know, what's the ultimate struggle of the of human condition, which is self-distance, right? Self-transference, I mean, getting some separation from your, not your thoughts and learning that that time in between thoughts is who's doing that. And that's proof that you're not your thoughts and so on. So uh, it's this notion, if the heart of the our struggle is, how do I get some separation? And much of our psych, much of the psychological self-help and even, even clinical help has been devoted to kind of the, 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 the task focused approach, right? Which is when you see a negative thought or a negative experience, you counter it, you reframe it, you think of all the reasons why that won't come true. You're using facts and logic to counter this part. And then it's a bit like the uh, whack-a-mole or mash the munchkins, as they call over here, you know, the little at the fairground. As a thought pops up, you whack it down with your toolbox and another one comes up, you whack that down. And the path to happiness is being able to, you're almost like drumming. I can, I can keep those, those thoughts at bay. But we know that that's really a difficult uphill battle that probably nobody has ever truly been able to manage, which means that it may be impossible. Because as neuroscience has told us, we have far less control over our thoughts and feelings as we'd like to believe, as anyone who, you know, the, 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 the funny, the pink elephant thought experiment in Psych 101 classes tells us. The moment I mentioned a pink elephant, you cannot help but think of a pink elephant. I can put thoughts in your head, even if you don't want them. Uh, so we don't have as much thought. So instead, rather than trying to count, what if we just said, I hear you, uh, thought, uh, but we're doing this anyway. Come along for the ride, right? So you're accepting that. You're not fighting it or pushing back against it. You're not admitting defeat by it either. This is the analogy of uh, all the Crowley with the chimp and professor. Say, I've got this, don't worry. We'll still be there. You'll still be there when this is over to moan at me and tell me why you're a disaster. But for the moment, let's just get on with it. So that is a much, seems to be a much more therapeutic and uh, and easier way and a less self guilt and self loathing way of doing it, right? Because I'm like, oh, what's the matter with me? Why can't I get a handle on this negativity and why can't I do this? And it's like, oh my God, you're so angry with yourself. There's no forgiveness of that. And it's like it's a human condition to have these unwanted thoughts. And so the analogy of the battlefield is you're standing on a grass hill and you're looking down at a sort of a brave heart type battle raging with swords and clashing steel. And, and on one side is the chimp and the one side is the professor in many ways, the things of what I want to do or the parts of you that you don't like, you want to change and the parts of you that you're trying to strive towards and to be the kind of person you want to be. And the, the myth that and we can only be happy until we have won that fight. And we spend, you know, lots of money and time and therapy bills trying to win that fight. And in actual fact, maybe this is controversial, not it's unfortunately it's no longer that controversial in science. What if we said, don't try and win the fight because it's not winnable? What if we just turned away from the battle for an hour, for five minutes, for a day? So this is akin to jumping, you know, hand in hand with your bringing your fears along for the ride. They're with you. They will always be with you. That's the, one of the big, I hate to tell you this, but all those little that voice in your head telling you, you can't, you're no good. I mean, will probably always be there in some shape or form. It's a, it's a you know, a part of the human condition. So how we listen to it, and I haven't, more importantly, I haven't got to win that fight. I haven't got to keep spending money on bigger swords and bigger shields and, you know, all the other tools. I can just say, what if I could just turn away? For it wouldn't that be nice and for many people who are struggling with a life with with years of dealing with negativity on this internal fight it's a relief to know that they don't have to have 10 years of psychotherapy or become a tantric yoga you know what i mean or whatever it's just like i can i can fake it i can just pretend i'm somebody else for a five minutes if that works or I can just get very good at putting on the horse blinkers, you know, like in a, a race. And so meditation and a bunch of psychedelics, a bunch of other techniques are able to or help us do this. And so one of the techniques in psychotherapy is called acceptance and commitment therapy. 
is a psychotherapy around this very principle. It's getting some separation between yourself and your thoughts and then learning, teaching yourself skills to run interference on those so that they don't ever go away, but you're just using a dimmer, you're training yourself to have a dimmer switch on them. Uh, and that seems to be a far more uh, 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 productive and cheaper way of getting to that point that I can live in peace with my own thinking. Okay, just to tie up this section, <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to briefly get your thoughts on roles of social networks and networks in general and health behaviors. I think mm. that you stopped using social media entirely a few mm -hmm. years ago. I wonder what yeah. your experience with that has been, but then also yeah. what are some examples of how networks can have positive effects mm. on health behaviors and yeah. what are some examples of their negative effects? Yeah, I mean, and even if even if you take it out of the realm of academic study and you know impression management and social, it just on a very human level is that I'm both a, compelled to know what's going on mm. in that in those worlds, but I also hate it at the same time. I come away feeling worse. I'm so, with or you. Sometimes I feel better, you know. So on that sense we all can relate to the power of learning more about where you stack in the league of attractiveness, intelligence, fitness, shagability, whatever the metric is of being having status in the world, is that the more you're, you bombard your brain with evidence that you are somewhere in that hierarchy and it's usually lower than you want to be, because we all want to be, you know, uh, higher than we are because we have egos uh it's gonna set off a cascade in your you know it's gonna lead you away from that default mode network into one of those tunnels those dark abysses and so when we think about social and, and in itself your brain i will say is a social comparison machine it will compare it will bludgeon you until you compare yourself so the the goal of trying to not compare to others is not just unreasonable it's probably irresponsible to try and get people to do that right so all these memes you know uh, comparison is the thief of joy and don't worry it dances though nobody's watching i mean all sounds good in principle but who's able to do that i care what people think i do i'm i'm, I'm human right and everybody does but the, it, the the issue becomes is what how you think where that information is coming from and how truthful it might be uh, in relation to the actual facts of life, uh, facts of where you are. So social media, Facebook and Instagram presents a curated view of the world in which everybody has the ability to pretend at, maliciously or otherwise uh, that they are higher in that hierarchy than they actually are, right? And in psychology, we call that impression management. Our brain and mind is wired to curate consciously and subconsciously an image, project an image to the world that makes us look good, sound good, feel good. Because, you know, historically and evolutionary, if you were ostracized from your troop, you would, or we know the reasons why we, we need to be within versus without our tribe. And so we will do that naturally. And so when you have a tool like social media that isn't just telling you information, it's giving you biased information about that because everybody is curating their own sense of, I wanna be, if everyone is saying, see how amazing I am, even if it's a, even if it's a humble brag, all you're gonna do with your brain is gonna be wide, oh God, I'm, I'm not like that, you know, and you're gonna just slip down these ladders, which are gonna make you feel worse about yourself. And if you've got a tendency for a very hard, built in default no but you're going to ruminate and worry so it's a recipe for you know nothing really good can come of it in terms of your sense of self and so i was on like everybody on social media and i still love i mean I'm, I'm, i haven't lost the drive of like you know the novelty and the the pleasure and the dopamine hit that you get from finding out how other people are doing but i had to really be careful and put stimulus control methods in place 
so that I didn't let myself go down that path because my chimp brain, five times stronger, five times more powerful, will go down there and convince you why you need to go down there. And uh, it's a dangerous game to play. And I think that we're seeing some of the the the, the out the, the the sort of the fallout from that now in society, and not all attributed to social media. So I decided to come off Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, and I still, you know, you can still do some stalking and grazing. You don't need to necessarily have accounts, or we have an account through our coaching business, and I'm on there for athlete chat. But I'm not really, you know, what is. Uh, uh, so-and-so thinking the latest rant about a politician and I'm getting angry about this and how can you, and then you get into the, you know, no debate is ever won in social media. So it's nothing was ever good. All I was doing was elevating my sympathetic response. I wasn't feeling good. I was feeling worse and sort enough and I got out of it. <laughs> but there are some instances in which they can help people. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Make changes yeah, yeah. for the better. I'm conscious of- They can. Do you want to provide a quick example of that, Simon? There's some evidence to show that, for example, one of the ways that we get confidence, what we call self-efficacy to do things, the belief in our, the belief in our skills to be able to do something well, different than general confidence, but a specific task, specific version. One of the drivers of that, not the most important by any means, uh, but one of the drivers is learning by seeing other people do it, like me, right? So the more I'm exposed to other people tackling and succeeding problems that I are nervous about tackling, the more confidence I have to tackle things. It's one of the a fairly robust finding in social psychology. So social media then uh, becomes a great environment to find people like me who are dealing with the same stuff, right? So whether it's support online support groups or forums or discourse boards or, you know, to say, you know, oh my gosh, there are other people of, I'm not alone in thinking like this and other people have done it, is really a powerful form of modeling or vicarious learning to get the confidence to do things. Now, when you are not doing that in a very targeted way, and let me just go on on Instagram reels and see if I can find reels to help my ability to do it. I'm that's the I'm looking in the wrong place for that. And you might stumble across a support group or someone who's expressing vulnerability about their abilities to or failures in that thing. But most of it isn't about that. It's all about successes and strengths. And we don't bond on strengths. We bond on weaknesses and vulnerabilities. So looking for places and how you use your social networks, you're looking for people who are able to express and expose challenges, weaknesses, vulnerabilities, but also things they've done to help their way out of it that might be helpful for you because they look and feel like you or they sound like you or they whatever are gonna be helpful. So patient support groups, joining, uh, like if you are struggling with uh, addiction or drinking, there are tons of great Facebook support groups now around particular methods of doing that that are very inclusive, they're non-judgmental, they're supportive, they're great uses of that, right? Um, but the other, the opposite is also true, and that's called Twitter. That's so that's the cool. trolls. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about all sorts of things, everything from just in time adaptive interventions yeah. to behavioral economics and many other subjects, but I'm, I'm conscious of the time. And what I'd love to do is just ask you briefly about your career transition and then mm. finish up with a few rapid fire questions. So you've, sure. you've had a seamless career transition from an ivory well, tower professor might... to a big picture screenwriter. <laughs> and we spoke... Well, that's the impression management part of it, right? But it's seamless. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's ugly. It's painful it's... <laughs> as well. Yeah. I mean, you spoke about this a little bit when I saw you in person over a few drinks, which were on Netflix. Thank you very much, Netflix, which yes, was a couple, uh, of, couple of nights before the BAFTAs. You shared some interesting ideas about what you would say to people who are highly skilled and who might feel like they've cornered themselves and yeah. they can now only go into certain lines of work, but they actually have skills that are transferable to mm -hmm. many different lines of work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And this is one of the sort of paradoxes of 
of all sort of career transition or all big life changes. And also, you know, it relates to one of the biases in human thinking. You might have heard of the um, Dunning-Kruger effect or ignorance is bliss effect is that there's a certain amount of our own ignorance sometimes can really help us, right? We don't, because we don't truly know what we're getting into, we're not bogged down in the, all the reasons why we shouldn't. Um, and there's a lot to be, there's a lot to be said for that as well. The chat, the downside, of course, is that as you become more, um, uh, as you strengthen those internal networks, as you become more and more of a thinker, correlated with more education, and it's not just about education, but if you're more of a cerebral internal thinking person, you become more and more aware of what you don't know. This is the Dunning-Kruger, right, part of it. So the smarter you become, the almost dumber you realize you are in the big scheme of things, because you realize the limits of your knowledge, right? Because you realize, oh my God, so, and so what? And so you almost start to have your negativity bias become stronger because you realize you start to see your skills as they're so specific, or they might be um, that to be successful in career X. Now I know about exactly what that involves. Oh my God, I didn't know that I would, ever, I would never try that or attempt that. So we're in this paradox. And so one of the things I think is especially true for academic career transitioners uh, or people who have been knowledge workers their entire life and they want to go into another field, either a knowledge field or something other than that, it might be a creative art or something else, is that we get paralyzed by thinking that we don't have the skills to pull that off. And the older you get, the more... The, the doubt and the sorts of anxiety or the things that concern you about making that transition. Oh my God, I'm, you know, I need, I should be at this period of my life where I'm not having to worry about, you know, paying mortgage payments or food or putting food on the table. I want to be able to have it. So there's a, there are economical and a whole host of other reasons in that. So, um, yeah, I was in academia for 15 years as a uh, professor or lecturer in, in UK terms. Uh, and, feeling and i was good at it actually but i didn't enjoy it as much as i and my brain had rationalized it you spent this much time in school and college and so i have to you know this is what you do uh but really the signs were there that i was never excited to get to or rarely excited to get to work in the morning right and my wife leslie who was a professional athlete is one of the you know fairly inspirational, lots of levels to me. She used to not be able to sleep at night because she was so excited to get training the next morning. I mean, that blew my mind. I couldn't even wrap my head around, not just about sport, because I could never think like that about activity, but generally, I'm, I'm so, I mean, you know, the night before a big holiday or something maybe, or something that's really exciting, but on a day-to-day -day basis with your career, oh my God. And so when you start to look at your own career with that sort of lens, you know, and you say, well, what are your Sunday afternoon? How do you feel on the Sundays? Do you still have that sort of dread of going back to work the next day? Or oh, rather than, oh my God, I'm so excited. It's so fulfilling. My North Star in values is behavior change, making a difference in the world by, through a different means, not necessarily through scientific behavior change, but through narrative storytelling and speaking to the chimp, which is what storytelling is essentially. Science is speaking to your professor, right? So I like that and I found I'm far happier. It doesn't mean necessarily it's gonna be more lucrative, but when you, it's a cliche, but when you really feel as though you enjoy it, that other stuff becomes less critical or you become less worried about where you sit in the hierarchy of, you know, uh, of uh, 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 socially. So yeah, that's where I'm at. So I love screenwriting now and, and my wife and I, with our first film, All Quiet on the Western Front, which was a success, not certainly just down to our, us and the script, but also how it was executed. It's like an amazing feeling. It's like, um, you know, when you look at the neurobiology of dopamine and you know that anticipation is driving, is its main function. It drives us towards goals because it gets us that level of anticipation of what could be versus getting and the pleasure of receiving. If you can find a job where you fall in love with the journey and the destination, if it happens, is great, but that's not why you're doing it. If you can get paid for the journey, independent of the outcome, that's also a great right way to have. I mean, talking about psychologically, not talking about productively and business 
you know, goals and stuff. We're just talking about psychologically. It's great. And that's what screenwriting has really done for me. You mentioned behavior change there. To me, All Quiet is relentlessly hard hitting. And I wonder mm-hmm. if you wrote it in part with a view to changing people's behaviors, but mm-hmm. I was wondering how you think your ability to actually change behavior compares now as a screenwriter mm-hmm. to as a yeah. professor of behavioral science? It, it, you know, it's funny. That's a really uh, interesting and, and insightful question. And one that, that I'm really glad because not many people like see that, that um, <clears throat> commonality, but there was one story from my academic life that drove this point home that I'll always remember. And it was from a colleague uh, who was in urban design to improve physical activity, you know, active transportation and so on. And one of the main findings of all of the research was that policy change for changing our physical environment to be more supportive activity, policy change. So now you're talking about, you know, legislation into law to promote these things and encourage these behaviors that are helpful. The biggest drivers of those things are not facts, data, and evidence. They are narrative, uh, emotive stories. So when we think about uh, a, a, a contentious, you know, things like gun control, it isn't, it isn't, laws don't get changed, certainly in the US based on facts and evidence. We know that they get based on little Jane, you know, was her life was taken early or Megan's law. They're around people and they're around people stories and urban design policy change. If you can have a compelling narrative around a person or a community that's been impact or will be, that's far more powerful than a meta evidence based approach. And so, now storytelling for me has become that way right it's like if you can change hearts and minds through talking to chimp right through storytelling versus facts and evidence they're not equivalent and they're not suggesting one should replace the other but it's you're you're in service of the same thing if you can get people to come out of a movie and within five minutes they're and after five minutes they're still talking not about the movie in the sense that the acting or the script or the lighting or the or how shaggable the stars were they're talking about what the film was about whether it's the betrayal of youth for war or the horrors they're still talking about an issue that is powerful stuff and then the wave that we have the 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 rise in the potency of documentaries now have been incredibly significant in this as a tool, as a public health tool for behavior change that can still, they bringing people in with compelling narratives versus I'm listening to, you know, a, a scientist talk about it. Uh, so scientific fueled narrative story design is like a lovely combo. You've said to me before that education can maybe help with behavior change among a minority, namely the pre-contemplators. So maybe <laughs> as a science communicator, I should just quit while I'm behind. But <laughs> moving- Ed- edut- Edutainment, I think that's what I call it. Yeah. yeah. Moving to some rapid fire questions. Yeah, yeah. First, the most important one. When are you gonna turn a primate's memoir the book by Robert Sapolsky into a screenplay for me. <laughs> I know that is a, a, you know, I wanted, I thought about that with Behave, his first book, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a head F, it's hard. Uh, I agree, that would make a, probably a great film. It's hard, the hardest point of storytelling, we've got a particular book we're dealing with this at the moment, bro- called Breaking the Story, is reading a book and figuring out where the compelling cinematic narrative is, because a book, isn't always, doesn't make a great translate. If you translated the book onto screen verbatim, it would be probably a really boring experience, the visual medium. So how you do that in a compelling way is really difficult. So I would really have to nail down what the core cinematic elements of that book are and how you bring them to life. I mean, that I don't know if you saw the documentary about Mark Manson's The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. I haven't actually. Uh, they, yeah, they've turned that into a movie. Yeah. It's actually more of a sort of a, uh, whether you believe or not that it's worked in that capacity. But suffice to say, that's the sort of way that a book like that probably would have to be adapted. I have seen Stutz, the Jonah Hill mm-hmm. documentary, yeah. which I actually thought yeah. was relatively effective. I don't know, have yeah. you had the chance to read Primate's memoir yet? 
I've read uh, not all of it. I've read a sort of, uh, you know, it's a tomb. Uh, I've read, I'm sort of like a, you know, 80 pages in uh, mm. that is one of these that, you know, is on my bedside cabinet and I just mm. keep not getting through it. But uh, yeah, uh, I do. I do like it, though. I love Sapolsky. I think mm. his insights are really remarkable and, and so on. So yeah yeah fan. some some of the anecdotes are, are absolute gold and it's quite different from something like why don't zebras get ulcers or behave i know i know i know next question yeah, has, has your mate tom converted you to scientology yet <laughs> well one i'll take uh uh you know i'm not uh, tom cruise i think that's who you're referring to uh is is yeah it's far from a close friend I met him <laughs> not my close friend uh um yeah so I, I've got mixed feelings about that like it's really weird I've got sort of you know as we are all cognitively dissonant it's like people that you admire and you love or you like what they do but there's a part of them that you're like I don't like that part why I don't that doesn't make sense to me you know it's like you know when you learn your you know the someone that you uh adored or is a role model and they end up being a you know a born again whatever some some belief system that really gets your back up it's hard to think about that but i think you know we're all that one of the things and this is in storytelling uh every human is flawed we're all we're all light and dark we're all good and evil rolled into one uh some of us are more of one than the other but but people are like that so I, i'm gonna take tom I, I like tom cruise i won't i won't be i'm not talking about his and i'll take him in an accepted true acceptance model i'll take him with all of his weird beliefs as well <laughs> he'd win in a fight you or leslie <laughs> a physical fight leslie. uh i don't know well let, let, here, here's why leslie would win uh, <laughs> this is why i rationalize it uh is because i am fundamentally a peacemaker and uh... peacekeeper i'm a resolve so i would even if i thought that it ain't worth it. I'll let you win. It's such a gentleman. That's that's my fragile male ego at play. Uh, you know, not letting someone win. <laughs> no, probably she, she probably would. She's got more drive, more, more more toughness than I have. And she play rugby. What are a couple of the most important things that you've learned from her? Uh, the power and the importance of having a good network. Uh, that. Uh, you know, getting where you want professionally is also about who you know and how you cultivate relationships, even if you don't see some, a direct, immediate payoff for that relationship. It's not to suggest that all relationships are transactional, but just the fact that you never know, expanding the people that you know for no, with no other emotive other than it's nice to know someone who is in the world that I want to be in is really helpful because over years that really bubbles up and helps you. That's one thing. Uh, I've learned that uh, persistence uh, and drive get you a long way uh, and just often many things in life. It's just be the last person to get, you know, to you just keep getting back up and just be still standing and that will rid much of the competition <laughs> of what you want. They're probably the two, the two biggest things, yeah. What about Stuart Biddle? Oh, Stewie. Uh, I love Stuart Biddle. So Stuart Biddle was my PhD supervisor and, you know, psychologist and, you know, big researcher. I, he had su he has such a lovely way about him, his personality. He's He really is one of the few, like, real senior academics that, that you don't get a sense of ego when you speak to him. Uh, he makes you feel smart. Uh, and in fact, often he makes you feel smarter than he is, which is a clever trick that he does because... Most of us aren't, and clever people do that, right? They make you feel smart, and they realize. So there's a simplicity in that. So yeah, I, I probably, I probably, uh, that those are probably skills uh, I've learned and I've tried to take on board, and certainly in my own mentoring. You sound a bit like him, so I figured that he must have influenced you a little bit. Yeah, he did. Have a huge influence on my life. Yeah, huge influence. What's a better form of contraception: endurance cycling or condom use? <laughs> uh, having a ponytail is probably better than all of it <laughs> going by chatting about films such as arrival i think that you've mm -hmm. got very good taste in films what are a couple of the most brilliant films that you see in the last five years apart from all quiet 
apart from our own. Um, a couple of amazing, but well, it's funny because f- choosing films that you like to me is like, um, or, you know, like what's your favorite film? It's like, you know, what's your favorite child or what's your favorite organ? It's like really hard. It depends on mm. where I'm, what I'm feeling at the moment. But I do love a good historical epic, right? I do love a big, uh, you know, whether it's the sort of the Saving Private Ryan or the Braveheart or the Gladiator. I do love those sorts of stories. Uh, I love um stories a big backdrop big backdrop but a small character driven story that's what saving private ryan is essentially but in terms of specific movies i saw a movie uh uh this no last year now called about love if you've seen that it's a remarkable film about a a woman in um a couple uh she is married to um uh, a Muslim man, and she's not Muslim. She converts, and then he's a he's a cross channel ferry driver, a ruck driver, and he ends up he dies actually. But she learns that he's had been having an affair with a woman in Calais in the port, and she goes over to try and understand. You know, her life has just been upended by this woman. Who is she? And when she knocks on her door, and the woman thinks that she's the cleaner that's come to clean. And she embeds herself in this woman's life, not in a sort of creepy way, but learning about her husband's relationship he had with this woman. It's incredibly powerful and and strong, and it's great. Another film is The Lost Daughter uh, with uh, Olivia Coleman and Maggie Gyllenhaal about maternal ambivalence. It was based on the Elena Ferranti novel, The Lost Daughter. It's a great film. Uh, and one of my favorite films of all time is Philomena, if you've seen Philomena with the Judy Dench and, uh, and um, Steve Coogan. Yeah, it's I, I, so uh, those are films I, la- I like, enjoy. Um, I find films that don't have much conflict in them, meaning they just sort of, they just bumble along about observational, I'm living through in the shoot. I find those a bit dull and boring. I like films with conflict. I don't mean like violent conflict, but I just mean tension between competing demands or being, you know, forced to confront your demons uh, on a, you know, daily basis because of the environments or situations you're in, those sorts of films I really love. And what are a couple of documentaries that have moved you? Uh, I thought Icarus was amazing. Um, I love that because it was, a, it's the documentarian's wet dream, which is you start off with a premise and the film, because of things that you didn't anticipate, turns your documentary into something completely different, which is way better and more compelling. There's a there's the one that that um, that was just won the Academy Award uh, this year called Navalny about mm, the brilliant. Russian dissident of, and a name dropper because our friend Mel Miller that was her movie and oh, and wow. uh, uh, we love we chatted to her yesterday we I love that film it's a it's just edited beautifully it's mm. a incredible way of telling a story that isn't not just a puff piece of one side or the other yeah so. Those are two. And then actually the, you know, is it my occupant? My, my, uh, my octopus teacher. teacher. Oh my God, I love that film. Yeah, They're making another so one good. actually, but I love that too. So clever, the world that you're in. You know, it's funny on a, on a film note, uh, it's so hard now to, to, to truly shock audiences or trick audiences or catch audiences off guard with plot because you, any film now, you know, you go into and you're, trying to figure out who done it or I bet this is really what it's about. You know, it's every, the days of being naive to the sixth sense and those sorts of films, it's hard to do that anymore. So one of the only ways that you can really get audiences on board is put them in a world, a story world that is so unusual and foreign that it's like, even if it's the same story about a David and Goliath or a fish out of water or, you know, whatever, but in a world that's so unusual, like Parasite was was amazing Mm. because of that uh and it's a world that i'm not used to it's great so i love s- stories set in worlds that i know nothing about or know very little about i find them really compelling and the new documentary series by the same director chimp empire is really good too mm-hmm. have you I seen seen that have you seen once upon a time in iraq bbc no i haven't is it good it's so good it's the it's the only documentary mm. that i've ever seen that at the end of the series i just burst into tears i just Oh my god! Couldn't contain myself. Anyway, well, is it when, when did it come out? Not long ago, maybe twenty twenty, mm. something like that. 
Mm. Other than Brave Athlete, <laughs> what are a couple of books that you would recommend? And they could be from any genre. So on the sort of self-help, you know, the stuff that we've been talking about is one is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, uh, which is about how, how we find purpose and meaning in the sandboxes of work, work love and suffering. Uh, I love that book as lessons in existential psychology and philosophy, but also this acceptance model of like how we move on despite what's happened to us. Uh, that's a great book. Um, I love, uh, there's a book uh, by um, Elena Ferranti, another Italian. It, may, it was actually made into a, into a series on HBO called My Brilliant Friend. There's another fantastic book about these two young girls in, in set in Naples mm. in the 50s and their relationship. And one is mysterious and they grow up as friends. It's about sisterhood and friendship and, and, and um, so envy and admiration. It's, it's lovely. It explores all the depths of the sort of the, you know, the human condition and spirit. But the, the, the book is and, and, and these authors that have such a great, great turn of phrase. It's just I love, you know, words words are my you know reading and and words are just sort of like to me foreplay of the highest order you know i just i love that world uh and words that taste good not just sound good you know and um so yeah i mean but it's so reading is such a individual thing where it's like wine it's like, i'll read this book and it was fucking awful like what do you mean it was amazing you know so it's kind of hard to tell people what they enjoy but uh, those are some books that i've really enjoyed other than being on this show, what's the most obscure request that you've had since your BAFTA and Oscar success? The most, I don't know, obscure request. Um, obscure request. We get a lot of now, like daily, uh, you know, uh, emails or direct messages. Oh my God, I've got this great, you don't know me, but I've got this great idea for a movie. And then they launch into this this idea, which may or may not be a great movie, but the mind out of which these stories come make me nervous, anxious, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, one uh, was about uh, like retributional anger uh, against sort of by a man. It was this idea of retributional anger against women who have slighted him. And it felt really sort of, in celly sort of like creepy weird shit you know and it just it didn't have a good feeling it leave really good feeling so we get a lot of those now uh but i know that the the the, the weird stuff the, what is weird is meeting your idols and in in cinema and realizing oh my god they're like normal people and they're dealing with the same shit right they're just it's, do it's like when you pull back the curtain of professional sport and you get to know or marry in my case elite athletes or athletes who are in the public eye or or and then you're like yeah but they're just them you know they're not and so we can copt archetypes and idols in our head and when you meet them they're often it's really comforting it's like oh my god i put this person untouchable on a pedestal and they're just you know some of the genius is there but they're also god i can is that what you think i thought you'd be have all the answers to everything and they don't this have all the same hang-ups and stuff as everyone else. <laughs> well, I think you might be one of those people soon, Simon. <laughs> soon. I, 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 <laughs> Not quite. No, I don't know yet. about that. <laughs> no, no. Never, never. Thank you so much for your time. I know that we were due to speak no, for my a couple gosh, of hours. It was pleasure, it's been three. Greg. No, no. I hope, uh, I hope there was uh, something of interest. I'm pumped to see what's in store for you. Are you in London soon? I'd love to catch up in person. We are on the 20th. We fly in on the 20th of June. Um, and then we're there. We've got, uh, there's a writer's strike on at the moment uh, in, in America, but it's affecting mm. writing globally because of lots of reasons. Uh, so it does make it life a little bit on the writing side of mm. our life, put on pause a little bit. But there are other projects that we're developing that not yet at the writing stage. And so... Uh, we're doing those and we have a film shooting in Scotland in October that we're doing the final location scout for in June. That's one of the reasons we're, uh, we're coming over. So the psychological yeah, yeah, lots thriller. Of, uh, it's a psychological thriller. Exactly. You know, yeah. I think I gave you that pitch already. Yeah. We've got Karen Gillan now attached to play the lead. Mm. Karen was in, is in guardians of the galaxy and Marvel um, movies. Red hair. Scottish. Yes. Yeah, Scottish yeah, lass. Yeah. 
Great. Yeah, yeah. So uh, she's playing the lead. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be fun times in Scotland. <laughs> uh, there aren't too many of those. Oh, how dare you? <laughs> Sc- Scotland's I lo- I amazing. Scotland. I, won't, I, Scotland. I won't have a bad word to say about Scotland. And then, Any more so than I would about England. I <laughs> and then finally, is there anything that you'd like to plug? <laughs> oh, my God. The 14-year-old schoolboy humor in me wanted to give you a good, funny oh, answer. Yeah. Um, I, 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 no, not really. Buy the brave athlete. Uh, go to the, in a, in a not in a selfish way, in a directly selfish way, go back to the cinema. Uh, you know, go see films on the big screen. Don't just get lost in distracted viewing on streamers uh mm-hmm. you know go and experience life with other people uh rather than just in a little more sophisticated man cave or woman cave uh get out there yeah so nothing i don't have any don't have any products or merch nothing like that maybe i should have well i think you should bring out a new glasses range <laughs> watch oh the space gosh, i know i watch this space i know i don't know about that but uh, <laughs> i i get pillared enough for my green glasses but you know what fuck it (laughs) superstar thanks simon all right mate good to chat yeah likewise take care